Our next talk is the Open Hardware Happy Hour, um, which is done by a bunch of people. So I'll not introduce them, but I will introduce themselves in just a few minutes. So the stage is yours. Have fun. Thanks, Carl. Well, thank you. Hey, um, hey, everybody. Good to see you all. <laughs> so, Daniel, you are the moderator. Why don't you start? Sure. Yeah, like um, happy that we're coming together here, and uh, we started like or we thought about starting an event series. Basically, this was the starting point, and we want to do it uh, every month. And we want to switch between like virtual events, like right now, but also like physical events, like the uh, happy hardware. The, hardware happy hour has <laughs> been but we have to see how it goes with corona and so on and we thought uh, it would be nice maybe if we start with a little intro round um i'm daniel i'm working for open knowledge foundation with max together and we are working on an Uh, prototype fund hardware that we want to present more in detail tomorrow at seven on the same stage unfortunately in german but uh, maybe there will be translation as well and i'm also working in a project called open next where we work with like small medium-sized enterprises and connect with them and build open hardware products basically and The idea was that everyone might say their connection to open hardware and because we're like in different places right now, maybe you can also say where you are and then hand over to the next person and I nominate Helen. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um, so my name is Helen Lee. Um, some of you may know me from the internet. Um, others of you may know me from um, from the hacker scene in uh, in Berlin or London. Um, I currently I just uh, moved to Portland actually, where I'm still doing hardware stuff. Um, I'm along with Drew Festini and Dave Darko. Um, we actually started the first hardware happy hour in Berlin, um, which was um, held in Exhein or one of the bars near Hexine. So I'm really really happy to see some familiar faces. Again. Again, I deeply miss, um, I deeply miss X time. Um, so what do I do with, with open source hardware? Well, everything that I do um, is shared um, in every way and open source part, hardware is part of that. To me, like open hardware falls under a wider remit of like an open society by sharing knowledge, by sharing resources, um, sharing technologies. You know, I think it's, it's part of a wider philosophical movement uh, shift towards openness. And, um, you know, as you can see in open data and open government, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I do a lot of my own work in hardware, mostly kind of little musical instruments um, and things with experimental materials. Uh, but also um, my job job is I work um, for Crowd Supply, who is, um, and they're an American company owned by Mauser Electronics. Um, all we do is open source hardware crowdfunding. That's it. Um, so <laughs> we've like hosted um, Bunny Huang and later all of all of Bunny and Zob's projects. We've done um, all sorts of different uh, exciting things. The Pierre Unra uh, from Timon, the um, German hacker as well. Lots of other things. So yeah, that's what I do. I both make open source hardware and I also help other people make open source hardware with credit supply. So there we go. That's that's me. <laughs> Who's next? Oh, should I, should I have nom nominated somebody? All right, um, Maximilian, go on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. And yeah, Daniel already said something about uh, me, I think. Uh, yeah, as uh, Daniel said, um, we work together um, at the Open Knowledge Foundation, um, setting up a prototype fund for open hardware because we are. We, we, we think that is that's something that need to be pushed and uh, need to get more attention and um, yeah my background is um, also kind of philosophical I studied some, um, some years ago um, uh, philo philosophy of technology and engineering and some kind of stuff and um, I'm very into open workshops so yeah hacker spaces like as a scene um, I'm board member of uh, the Verbund offener Werkstätten this is a German network of open workshops and so yeah this is my connection to all this um, and I think uh, yeah of course open hardware is uh, a very important um, uh, movement uh, if it comes to to uh, 
yeah, to, to a society um, in which uh, uh, we um, uh, take care of our things and uh, yeah, and and and, and uh, save uh, resources and all these kind of stuff, which is important at the moment, transparency and so on. So yeah, I'm very into um, this topic and um, uh, I'm, I'm I'm happy to to discuss all of this with you. And I don't know if Mitch. Is there? I, I don't know. I can't. I cannot see him. I don't, um, maybe. I think he's on the left of the big screen with everyone. Mitch. Yeah. So. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Mitch, and I'm sitting here at Exhain in Berlin, uh, live while all of this RC3 stuff is happening, while everyone else is in various places in the world. And like everyone else, I've been working with hard open hardware for a long time. Uh, what made me kind of open uh, uh, or uh, internet famous is an invention of mine, which is a keychain that turns televisions off in public places called TV Be Gone. Um, yeah, and it's like everything I do open. And even though it's open, a lot of people think, well, it's open. How do you make money? Well, the thing is, the only reason why I've been able to make a living off of this for the last 18 years, which I have, along with 12 friends of mine who, was, who have also made a living off of this for the last 18 years, is because it's open. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. But um, be, uh, the biggest thing is, when it's open, there are a lot of people who are helping, and not just me and my little brain. Uh, my little brain works well some of the time, but when we have a lot of people looking at something, we have a lot of brains that are working uh, a lot of the time, and together we have something much more powerful than each of us can do alone. And if we're going to have an... Um, Yeah, and those people are, are constantly telling other people about this project, which is PR that I would never, ever, ever be able to afford as someone with a small company. So, um, yeah, and if we're going to have any kind of chance for survival as a species, I think part of it is going to be because we have open projects that exist because people find it meaningful. And when people find it meaningful, it's going to be used for things that are worthwhile rather than just maximizing profit for corporations, which is responsible for so much of this downward spiral where we find ourselves into uh, environmentally and economically and uh, data protection-wise and all these other reasons. So, um, yeah, maybe we'll be talking about some of this later tonight. So, yeah, Cedric, you're the next person. Thank you, Mitch. Um, difficult to go after you. <laughs> I'm yeah, just a just a random embedded system engineer going back to school um, for a PhD, trying to get out of this industry pressure of money with hopefully some options using academia. Um, I'm experimenting. Let's see where it goes. And yeah, basically, yeah, my background is in music. I kind of. Um, Yeah, I ended up diving in this um, hardware world because I was fixing my computers. I wanted to understand how to fucking make my own machines work. And, and I ended up studying this and yeah, uh, 10 years of engineering now. And uh, yeah, I ended up collaborating with artists, um, making some sorts of interactive um, um We had interactive systems with, I don't know, wearables for dance that would control visualizations and sonifications and uh, textiles. And um, and that brought me to, I don't know, reverse engineering chemical processes to make um, my own sensors and help people make their own. And and I think, the, yeah, the question, why do we want to open up everything we do? I think we all have a, a personal life story I, I'm guessing at this mine is that I grew up in these kind of hippie communities where everything was shared. It was just not even a question. And and grow, growing up in this uh, industry hardware world, to me it was obvious that the hackerspace approach was the the most uh, appropriate, sharing ideas and technology so that we all uh, grow together. I think that yeah, that was my motivation. Um, maybe I'll share more about that. Uh, later. Penny, do you want to take the mic back? 
Yeah, but I also feel like, like um, unfortunately, we're missing uh, three people, I think, that wanted to be on the stage. Uh, Drew wasn't able to make it, unfortunately. And um, But I think we can also, like, like, I'm just thinking, maybe it also makes sense to ask questions to each other simply and like like because i think we all have a lot to share and maybe we can yeah um, and, and also, only one if role. anybody did have any questions um around the work that drew is doing in risk five i mean i'm not an expert but i am married to him so we do have conversations about this a lot so i know kind of what's going on in the world of open processes and open silicon so i can talk about open silicon a bit <laughs> maybe do that right now because because i think it's super interesting like oh it's so cool and actually there's a really good opportunity to get involved right now as well so so for those of you that don't know, um, there's, there's a guy called Tim Ansell who does a lot of work in this space. And I really recommend you check out some of his talks. Um, he, he, he's a Congress person as well. So he's done some really interesting talks um, on Open Silicon at Congress. The last time we were in, in you know, in, in meat space, um, he gave a talk about this exact subject. But it's now, you know, several years down the line and this project has evolved. So let me, t let me take a couple of steps back here. So when we think about open hardware, we often think about the physical physical, you know, like the PCB, right? So like the finished, the end product, you know, like how you make a TV gun, for example, you know, or a synthesizer, another, uh, in our due touch, another Mitch example, right? So those are the end product. But really what we're looking at with open source um, silicon is looking more about the processes and we're looking at like how to get open all the way down, right? So there's one thing to release your board design files, but then how does that board get made? And how do we pass on the knowledge about making these boards, right? And then furthermore, or you go further down, 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 you start going, well, how is a transistor made? Like, how do we even make a chip, you guys? Like, how do we know? And as it turns out, that knowledge is extremely proprietary. So like making, like, it's not just like the, like the, 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 like the design files, right? It's the physical processes here are not transparent at all. In fact, they're completely proprietary. And that knowledge is sequestered away um, in like a few small and a few massive foundries, right? So obviously, Obviously, I mean, hello, we're having a chip shortage, you know, having having like all of the production centered on these individual things. It's not just like a philosophical question. It becomes a logistical problem here. It's like, how do we even make these things that we can't, you know, get hold of anymore? So Google and um, and like eFabulous, which is a, a kind of like a, a, a location. I'm, I'm, this is this is like all secondhand knowledge as well. So like I'm not, but like Mohammed from eFabulous has been really going on about this. And like um, the Skywater people at Google, they've been working together to create an open source series of instructions, right? And um, that go all the way down. So you can make fully open source silicon so that there's a replicable process for this creation of silicon. There is a way to onboard people. So that's this process that's been going on, right? Been going on in the background. But where it is right now is a really exciting stage in that they are actually opening up what they call these flights, right? They call them like flights, um, like when you go and make a chip, right? There's a bunch of them happening right now that anybody can get chips made for free, right? Anyone. I'm not just, not academics, like not chip experts, anyone. I'm talking like hobbyists are getting made, like chips made themselves for free. The only stipulation for this is that the, the source, it has to be open source, right? And I'm guessing if you're interested in this talk, then that's probably not a problem for you. <laughs> like, um, and even if you don't know anything about creating chips, so there's a really awesome course that's being run by Matt Venn at the moment called Zero to ASIC, which is all about getting hobbyists involved and creating their own chips. So to, if there's a conversation to be had around open silicon, it needs to be happening now because there's so many exciting things happening in that space. Um, so if anybody's interested in creating a chip, go out there right now, go Google Tim Ansel or, you know, DuckDuckGo Tim Ansel, <laughs> like, um, which is, I use DuckDuckGo to be fair. Um, so, and look at what he's up to you. And I mean, he's not the only person involved. Obviously, there's many, 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 many people in that. It's just that he happens to have a lot of the best talks about it. So go and look at that. Um, and yeah, go right now because you can get onto the shuttle um, like right now. You can go and make your own silicon um, for free.
and make it open source and be part of this whole open down to the transition level movement. So that's um, that's what that's that's to my best knowledge. I, again, this is like just me reading articles and being interested in this. It's not like I'm not I've not made a chip. I've just you know listened to a lot of talks around it. So that was my summation of what's happening in open silicon. So do apologies if I got some of that wrong, but I hope I hope I've given you some inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, these open, um, open silicon um, movements or like projects, they are very important and uh, they are maybe also like kind of uh, connected to the way of uh, uh, how open source works in the software um, context. Um, I think this is something which uh, is, uh, is, is, um, uh, is, is true for electronics in general. Be because you can use some some of the functions how software um, works in, in this kind of context, but um, uh, uh, um, yeah, what what I think is uh, still a problem uh, if it comes to open hardware, um, and this is uh, a question which uh, I would uh, raise in this uh, circle here. Um, when do you think is open hardware like um, like a, a real must have or something like this? Because this is something what we are asking ourselves at the moment. Um, uh, if it comes to this funding um, uh, process, so uh, uh, um, what? Which uh, I think uh, open source hardware is nothing which is like something um, which makes sense uh, in itself. Um, you know, it, 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 uh, technology is always connected to a specific aim, and this. It's also something which is connected to open source, and yeah, which kind of at, at, at which point open source hardware is uh, um, is very um, uh, uh, a must have um, in your point of view. This is my question. <laughs> yeah. I, can I be a little uh, on the joke side and say, when is it not like? Is there any reason to not open source anything? That's that's the way I try to think, and because anyway, if people really want to see what's inside your hardware, they will they will find out. There's just no valid reason to close source anything. That's my opinion. Because yeah, we will figure it out anyway. So like when, uh, if we want to, sorry, if we really want to answer that uh, serious question, I would say maybe the security um, field is where it's the most needed. But I think for educational purposes, everything should be open. Sorry, Daniel. No, no, sorry. But I, I was just... That's, to, that's to, great. That's an interesting point. I, like, I would say that I'm on the other side of the scale a little bit in that I'm just a... At heart, I'm a pragmatist, and I understand that we don't live in Star Trek The Next Generation as much as I wish that that was true. You know, we do still, you know, we do still exist in a society, you know, <laughs> and we do have to, you know, pay our bills and so on. So, like, I mean, like, so for example, at Pride Supply, like, we are open hardware, but we don't make everybody do the Oshawa standard open hardware, right? We're just trying to meet people where they're at and get them one step further, right? So if they're, if they're open to showing their schematics, we're like, okay, so open your firmware as well. If they're opening their schematics and their firmware, I'm like, why aren't you releasing your board layers? Because you know they're already on that journey, right? So you've just got to be like, like little by little, like, come on give the people what they want. <laughs> like, but I think you do have to be pragmatic. You know, you can't like yell at people for not being at this on the same page as you. Like, I just don't think that's, you know, positive, but no, I do agree with you. Like I'm a rank hippie myself, like, but <laughs> I'm also a pragmatist. <laughs> I, I listen to you. I'm just trying to push it the other way by thinking, yeah, the other way. But I, I still think that it doesn't really help a lot to, Close source anything. I, I don't think it, so why not just embrace that? Then? Yeah. yeah, I think this is. I think we are. We are, um, and maybe we have all the same uh, idea if it comes to this ideal. But if it comes like to the real world, <laughs> and and then and you want to like push for open hardware, and you want to to get politicians and so on on your side, and, and then then you have you need to have a strategy. Uh, and you need to have good arguments um, how this open hardware thing can work in this like very yeah capitalistic society and uh, where, where for a lot of things are not these like business concepts to to have this kind of stuff open hardware maybe so, so I, I think this is a very complicated 
question. And of course, it, it is always connected to, to a specific thing, maybe. And uh, um, yeah, and, and you, you ask me uh, if there is something which should not be open hardware, or like, I don't know, not should, but maybe there's something very, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, Helen, you are also um, um, more on this side. This, if it comes to art or, um, you know, that I think it, it's nice that some things are just special, handmade, and are, 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 are now the thing that they are. So, you know, um, but this is, this is a little bit too, 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 um, yeah. I, I don't want to talk about this, like, uh, in a philosophical way, maybe more in a pragmatic way. So, yeah. No, have a difficult I, have a I, I really, I, I had a question that I wanted to talk about. Can I, can I send a question out there for other people? All right, I'm really concerned about how people in open technologies, hardware, software. I'm really concerned about how we treat them and how we help them earn a living. Um, I see so many people in open source burning out um, and people who are, you know, if they were in industry, they could be earning a lot more money or this, like, and like, that's, that, that's a, a question, a problem that really bothers me, like, at night. It's like, how do we help people who are working in this way make a good living? Is it by helping them create products? Is it by, like getting some kind of Patreon thing. I mean, like, how do we, how do we support the people? And like, and all of those things, like the Patreon, the, all those things like are predicated on you being good at marketing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. Like, how do we help people who are making open source not pay the rent, you know? Like what, like, you know, inspiring example, like, I mean, like I can give inspiring examples of some people who are doing things like, but like, how are people keeping their lights on? Is this a hobby? You know, do you just have to work for Red Hat? Like, or Reno or something? Like what, what is like, how do people make a living in open source hardware? How do we support that? So I'll be here interested to hear your thoughts. I well, think I, that Mitch would probably have good answers. Yeah, I, I can address that from my perspective. Um, you know, I was super lucky enough to come up with a project that caught the um, uh, that that caught the ear of the media. The media loves um, examining its own navel, and I created something that turns TVs off in public places, and media loved it, and they spread it all over the world within the first two three days of my project being available to the world on my website and it changed my life forever for the better and I've been making a living from it ever since. Not everyone's going to be that lucky to come up with a project that um, markets itself. So, you know, like, like, like you said, Helen, it's really important to be able to spread the word about your project and not, you know, to, to make a living as, you know, a good example is an, as an artist. So, to make a living as an artist, you not only have to be able to do art that's meaningful for you, like something's burning inside of you and it needs to come out into the world, uh, you have to have skills for being able to do that. And similar with an electronics project or a software project or any kind of project, we have to have the skills from taking something that's meaningful for us, burning inside of us and putting it out into the world because we really need to do that. The only other choice is to fight ourselves. And if we fight ourselves, as I like to say, you know who loses. Um, but that doesn't mean you have the skills for putting your project out into the world. How do you put the project out into the world? That's a whole nother skill set. And if you do put it out in the world, now you've got to be able to deal with bookkeeping and paying taxes and running a small business. Maybe you need help and you need to have employees and you need to be able to know who to hire and who not to hire and who to fire if it comes down to that. Running a business is another whole set of skills. And being able to juggle all of these things, learning them as you're doing everything, it's not easy and it's rather stressful. But it's something that's burning inside of you that needs to come out, so it's worth doing. But there's no easy answer for all of this. Uh, but I think one of the keys is to be part of a community where there are people supporting each other, first of all, into making time and making it fun to make time to explore what it is that might be meaningful 
to each and every one of us. Because uh, we don't necessarily know. We're not trained for that after going through school for 16, 18, whatever years uh, each of us has gone through school. Um, <laughs> uh, as uh, some people have famously said, the, the school system beats the creativity out of us. Um, so we need to have a space to explore what's meaningful for us. And when we're doing that in a community that's supporting us to do that, we can do that easier and better than if we're doing it on our own, which harkens back to open hardware, open source again, because um, again, it's a whole bunch of people, more eyeballs, more brains, more psyches, more people looking at something and improving it as a result. We can do something much better in community than on our own in general. And when there's a community of people involved, who many of whom also see meaning in the project that you're doing, many people might want to help. And some people might be good at creating a logo and they can give you uh, an idea of a way to put your project on another level that you might not have thought of on your own. There might be someone who can uh, either help with bookkeeping or recommend a bookkeeper. There might be who, who loves what they do and, and helps people doing that. There might be people who are good at running small businesses who can give you ideas. And, you know, I learned all this stuff on my own as, uh, as TV Be Gone suddenly became an over, literally overnight hit. Uh, I had to learn all this stuff, and I was fortunate that I could do that. But I was also very fortunate that I had a whole bunch of friends who were really good at doing all these things, who had time when I needed their help. Uh, there's a lot of luck and circumstance involved as well, like with all of uh, with all of life. So yeah, so there's no magic, easy answer that's good, one size fits all. But in that kind of abstract um, answer, there's perhaps keys for every one of us in all of our projects. Um, uh, uh, because it's connected to the question of Helen and uh, maybe to a question uh, in the internet, uh, I would uh, just say that there are maybe also examples i don't know how they like if they have like a, a, a good life or not not this stressful life what you said Helen. i think uh, um lucas from berlin who made this um uh, uh open hardware um, notebook here um, yeah <laughs> but somebody asked if, if we can could, could name somebody who made something open hardware like and uh, this is the, the one mnt reform um, or m and uh, uh, Laboratories in Berlin. Um, I think he had a very stressful life creating this uh, notebook because he, uh, he made all these uh, things uh, on his own with a small team and yeah, he had like a small production line in his uh, office. And um, yeah, but, but he, he made this possible with, uh, with uh, this uh, kind of um, yeah, uh, internet funding way. Um, uh, uh, There are other examples like of uh, this, um, but yeah. But then we come to to this problem of uh, um, open washing. I don't want to name them because yeah. then we have a new topic. <laughs> well, I think actually, um, that's an interesting topic. Well, it's, it's, okay, I can add some really good because I also saw that question. Some good examples of people doing so. There's Great Scott Gadgets in the US are doing really great work, um, and they do really cool, like really cool open source tools. I'd also check out the work of Peter Esden, um, who who's the who's behind a bunch of different open source tools as well. Actually, Peter Esten's got a really interesting kind of like individual business model in that he does like he does like electronic streaming on Twitch as well, um, as well as doing his like proper hardware stuff. Um, so that's really interesting. So Peter like Peter Esten, Grace Got Gadgets, Lucas, um, Timon Sku um, is another really interesting, um, and he's he's like a hardware designer but with a product design background as well, similarly to. Um, well, I don't know, like, like Lucas has got a product design background as well, but like Timon did the P Unera, which was a CM4 carrier board um, with an Arduino form factor, really cute little board. Um, there's a lot of people doing interesting things. Um, who else is good? Of course, Adafruit um, and release their designs as well. Um, yeah, Spark Fun, Seed Studio in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Evil Mad Scientist. <laughs> Yeah, EMSL. I don't know if EMSL do a lot of open hardware, but not all of them are open, I believe. Um, 
but anyway, yeah, they do some stuff in that space. But, uh, why is there so the... much SDR stuff happening in There's so the much SDR place, stuff right? happening right now. It's been bonkers. Uh, uh, quite loads of, at the moment, actually, one of the best things about my job at Crowd Supply is I get to see, like, all of the submissions that are coming in from, like, all over the world. Like, I get to see, like, so we actually turned down, like, 90 to 95% of everybody who applies to Crowd Supply, which is a fact not a lot of people know. Um but we get to see what everybody's working on everywhere. And I've got to, and it's really fun to see all the trends in open hardware. Like people have really gone for S, like SDR. They're going, they're going like bonkers for SDR at the moment, which is really, really fun to see. Lots of risk five stuff in the pit pipeline as well, which is really cool to see as well, particularly with this new all winner D1 chip, which is quite exciting. Go. Yeah, I was wondering why do people get turned down? Is it because uh, you try to help them not to waste their time on something that's not realistic and they will just die? We, oh. No, we're, we're very strict. So we, we, we would not take any product that hasn't got a finished prototype. So our oh. worst nightmare would be vaporware. So we mm. require a fully functional prototype, which like a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, we can do this. And we're like, okay, cool. Show us. Fair enough. First. <laughs> <laughs> like cool <Yeah. laughs> sounds amazing and that's how we <laughs> and then we also get like a bunch of people who are like crowdfund my sewing factory and we're like no <laughs> we do electronics <laughs> like so we... <laughs> there's yeah. a big project that is open source that maybe we should not talk about but the tesla cars are open source open hardware only I don't know only what's... partly yeah only partly the it's the battery fun, yeah. yeah the the battery charging stuff is open source but a lot of it is not open source they they keep okay. it purposefully uh proprietary because they uh from their point of view anyways they have all these things that need to ha uh, pass safety standards and and whatnot they don't want people going out that uh doing things based on their designs that they'll be liable for I, I was actually not aware why they do that why they, why did they open that's interesting it? i didn't know that either yeah. yeah, well, I know the person who started Tesla Motors, and it wasn't uh, that guy uh, that everyone's probably thinking about. <laughs> be named. Yeah, and um, <laughs> it was my friend Martin who started it long before anyone even knew that name that shouldn't be named. And, um, and he got fired by that guy who shouldn't be named, and he uh. had to be sued in order to get his stock back because the guy stole it, et cetera. That's a long story. But anyways, he, he uh, had to come down um, with, you know, in the practical aspect of starting a vehicle company that was going to be um, competing with General Motors and various other big car companies. How do you do that? And he wanted things to be open, but he didn't want to be um, liable for things that could destroy the company as well. Interesting. How do you deal with liability issues? Because it comes up again and again, because like people are also afraid that their brand gets gets uh, damaged and so on. So like, is there like a how-to of like avoiding liability issues or you just need to hire a lawyer or like, like how do you do it, Mitch? Do you, do you have problems? Have you had problems personally in that field? I have, interestingly enough. Even though TV Be Gone is a totally open source project, there was someone who stole it. And that was uh, a former customer. <clears throat> as soon as he stole it, he was no longer a customer. So um, uh, suddenly there were things that looked exactly like TV Be Gone remote controls out in the world, but with a different box, but with my name on it. And uh, so I. I, I have a bunch of fans, right? When you're open source, there are a whole bunch of people who are looking out for you. And so within an hour and a half of this thing going out in the market, I had uh, like 100 emails saying, what's this? This probably isn't you. What's going on? So I called up my ex-customer, <laughs> by then ex-customer, and he said, oh, yeah, you weren't giving us a good enough price, so we reverse engineered it. And it turned out they did very poorly, but they had my name and my trademark on the box. Oh, no. So I had to sue them to make them stop because this was a piece of crap. Uh, so I didn't want to license my name to them because it was just so it, it was it would destroy the product because I bought a bunch and a third of them didn't work. And the ones that did work didn't work very well. All they had to do was copy exactly my plans, which were freely available online, and they would have had a great product, but it might have cost more than they wanted. So they reverse engineered 
engineered it and made these pieces of crap. And I had to hire lawyers. Fortunately, uh, my brother's a lawyer, and he loves what he does. He recommended uh, someone in the UK where this horrible company was uh, to help me, who also loves doing what um, they were doing, and they helped me. And that was stressful, <laughs> and it cost me uh, because in, in the UK, the um, uh, in order to stop frivolous lawsuits, like in the US, which is a very litigious society, uh, they make it so that it's very, very difficult to even make back your, all of your legal fees, let alone make a profit off of a law case. Uh, so even if you're 100% in the right and the judge says, yes, you're 100% in the right, the most you ever get back in general is like 65% of your legal fees, which became yeah. quite high. So I lost 65,000 pounds in this process. So that was quite a bit of money. And that, that meant that I lost money for a year and a half before I started making money again on my product. <laughs> So that that was stressful, but the thing is, um, we live in a world where uh, maybe you've noticed there's like sort of capitalism all around us, and in capitalism, any way people can make money, they will, including with lawsuits and including by stealing uh, open source projects if they think they can make a quick buck on it. So that's what these people did. By the way, these people are long out of business. Uh, it didn't work for them. It backfired. Um, so. The thing is, we, we, we really can't stop that from happening. But if we put our thing out in good faith into the world, into a context that we believe in, um, chances are much better that things will work out for us. There's no guarantees for sure. Uh, but since, especially now, we're, we're, when we put out open source projects, we have a lot of goodwill. And therefore, people are very much willing to help us much more than they would for a proprietary product. And there are even lawyers who are willing to give us a, a little bit of a break, and sometimes for free, if it's an open project rather than a proprietary project. So there's this going for us, at least for now. I think that's a pretty good transition for this uh, time you spent in China exploring all of the um, industry, all of the, all of the things you, you explored there. And, because China has interesting IP, more flexible and uh, more interesting um, innovation. Mitch, would you talk about that? I, I think like that's a good moment to discuss. I think that would actually be a really good question, like because the, the you know like culturally the idea of open hardware, even from Euro moving from Europe to the US, completely different. Um, for different reasons as well. Like yeah, and um, yeah, China's again like. Very, very. Did Mitch just disappear? Um, so I, I disappeared momentarily for a technical reason, um, but I'm back. So, uh, but I heard what you were talking about. China is a very interesting um, set of circumstances. The talk at Exane right here before ours was a pre recorded talk about uh, mythology around China. And that was a very interesting talk that's worth looking up if you missed that. Um, China is very much a mixed bag, but if you're going to do anything um, in electronics, China is probably the place you're going to have to deal with, at least in part, because that's the place in the world that has the complete supply chain. The, the, whole, the whole deal is there. PC boards, in general, are made there. The, uh, many of the parts are made nearby, if not in China. Uh, they're distributed through China. Stuff is manufactured in China. It's just all of the resources there, in general, are in China. Adafruit is, is a pretty good exception to this, because they try as much as they can to do things locally. Locally, which for the in their case is in the United States, um, in China it's it's the most capitalist place in the world, despite what uh, the mythology around China uh, claims. But um, there, when people want to make money uh, because there's capitalism all around, the, any way they can do it, they do. And so there's a lot of people who are focused on just making the money and not doing things well. So if you're going to do things in China, it's really important to, or anywhere in the world, it's really important to do your homework and to talk to these people and, if at all possible, to visit. Um, because when you visit a place, you might find out that they were just telling you what you wanted to hear rather than the reality. And also, just uh, you, you can do projects remotely, but it's, it's much, much better 
when there's face-to-face contact, and then you get to know people's sort of body language, and you can get to see, oh, these people are really friendly. You learn to trust each other much, much quicker than it's if it's remote. And then when there's a misunderstanding, and there always will be over email or whatever, then you just like, oh, that person's really nice. There, there must be some reason for for this misunderstanding, and it's much easier to clear up. So. Um, yeah, the uh, PC boards for our little projects, we can go to PCBWay or uh, JLC PCB or any of these other big ones. And it's really inexpensive to jumpstart your project this way. And it takes very, very little money. It just takes your time. And then once you have that, you can find some good manufacturers. I found one that I've been with since 2005, uh, and they're th- th- fantastic. They've helped me so much. They take responsibility for when they make a mistake. and everyone one makes mistakes. Um, uh, some companies don't do that. Uh, and, and they also are very, very happy to help people with their open hardware projects, even if it's just small quantities, and help them put it out into the world. And they have a lot of experience at this point, And a lot of that experience they gained uh, through helping me put out my projects, and we learned together. So, if anyone out there has a project that they um, uh, think can benefit from an actual manufacturer in China, uh, contact me. It's totally fine, and I can connect you with them if uh, if you get a good feeling from them. Maybe they're a good match. But you should always ask like one or two other companies. Um, if you can, just to make sure as a reality check and pick the ones that you feel are best for you. Because the manufacturer you have, if you go that route, is basically a partner, even if they're not a legal partner. Because that, they're, they're part of your life. Everything they do reflects on you and not so much on them. So, um, But the interesting thing with China is that everything is based on relationships. And that's true all over the world, but even more so in China. So, even though it's the case that it's capitalism and people will make money any way they can, uh, legally, ethically, or otherwise, um, relationships are very valuable there. So, if they're going to sacrifice a relationship that they've built up with you, whether it's for a few days, a few weeks, or a few years, they're not going to do that lightly, just for a quick buck so easily. Some will, but most won't, because the relationship is valuable. Because who knows where that goes in the future? It might go nowhere, but you know that connection connects to other people, connects to other people. The relationship I have with my manufacturer um, means that I've recommended, and it's one that I value and that they value. Uh, that means that I've recommended people to them, and some of those connections have made them tens of millions of dollars, US dollars. So, that's a super valuable um, relationship that they don't want to sacrifice with me just to make a quick buck by copying my thing, for instance, uh, or copying any of the people I recommended to them, because that would sever a whole bunch of relationships. So, learning to navigate all of these things is really valuable, and that's part of the, the bag of tools that we all have to have if we're going to go the route of making a living on our projects. And even though that's not necessarily easy, I want to encourage people to explore that as a possibility so that we all make a living, as all of us do here, um, doing things that are meaningful to us, things that we love doing, rather than just getting some stupid job that makes us enough money so we can buy food and shelter so we can have, hopefully have enough time to do things that are meaningful. These are both hey, options. Hey, oh, sorry, Mitch. Um, Louis Philippe joined also, and uh, hey. and we do a quick introduction. You do a quick introduction yourself, oh. maybe, and then we use the uh, five minutes of our extra time or something to to speak a, quickly a little bit about like open climate and like open hardware in that connection or something. I'd suggest. Yes, I'm very happy to be here with you all. Um, I was uh, telling everyone before the session um, that. It was this was a great excuse for us to see each other, um, <laughs> and turns out I made a horrible mistake of like miscalculating the time zone difference. So I thought like the session was going to start um, 16 minutes from now, <laughs> and I'm terribly late. So I'm really sorry for being like horribly late. It's, it sucks. So I'm not feeling very good right now. Nobody minds. Nobody minds. <laughs> We're just happy to attend up. We're just happy you're here. Don't don't yeah, feel bad. So- 
I, 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 it's good to see you all. So basically, I don't want to just um, um, interrupt this important conversation about China and open hardware. So basically, um, to, just to say a few words um, real quick. So uh, my name is Philippe. Um, I know most of you <laughs> from our um, hackerspace and hardware and free software adventures in different parts of the world. Um, I've been, uh, I've, I'm one of the founders of the Journal of Open Hardware, and I've been involved in, in, in free software for a while, um, helping uh, organize the International Free Software Forum Brazil um, for, you know, for, for a while. And um, I'm really interested now, and in, I'm working in a new project in Alaska, and I'm interested in open hardware uh, scientific instrumentation. How can we bring open hardware to um, climate research and uh, to create a culture of hardware sharing, not only software sharing for scientific research, but community science that is grounded in the practices that we developed in free software and open hardware. So I'm really uh, uh, dedicated to that. I know um, you're all very interested in this, and I think this is an, an important opportunity for us to discuss that. But I will not say anything anymore. I'm going to zip up, and then we can go back to China and then return to go to, to, to the topic of climate later. If I may, I think there's a, a great connection, and I, I feel like... We can use this, uh, like you were talking about people cloning projects, Mitch, and and I, I feel like there's probably a way to hack the hackers, if we can call them like that, or hack the cloners, by giving them this fake idea, or, or, or actually a real one, that this particular hardware can be used for other things, and they can think, oh, I can make a lot of money with that, and, and they will replicate your project and make it even more affordable, and so that everyone can benefit out of it. I think there's some interesting half hack of hack that should be thought of. Yeah, how can uh, we? There, there's. Uh, I was uh, a hacker in residence at a hackerspace in Zagreb, Croatia, uh, called Radiona, and they actually came up with uh, that idea that you just said for their project, uh, which is an open hardware platform for FPGAs. They did not want to. They didn't have a budget for one thing, but they didn't want to like devote their lives to making a budget and create a um, a company and all of this stuff. So that what they wanted to do was to have a, a Kickstarter project or some kind of crowdsource thing that made it look like this is a super popular thing, so that some companies in China would just replicate this thing and put it all over the world, and then they wouldn't have to do anything. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, I don't think they ever did that, but. Uh, I just saw their project in the PCB Way um, annual contest, which I've been a judge for for the last four years, and I was just seeing that. So they're still working on this project four years later, and um, hopefully things like that will get put out into the world because this is a way for people to make super powerful complicated projects with very inexpensive hardware. And um, so, if, um, if there are ways to get this out into the world, uh, a lot of people can benefit from it. Um, I think this uh, uh, um, topic, uh, open source hardware and the, and the science context, uh, uh, is very interesting, and um, I want to to raise again my question from the beginning. But I will. Uh, I want to precise it a little bit more because what 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 I meant with my question at the beginning is: Is there something um, uh, which we can uh, call like a public interest tech in the hardware scene? So, like like technology which need to be open. Like uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and because it 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 it, it, it has an aim which helps uh, everybody in a kind of sense. It's not just like a toaster or something like this. It's it, uh, I think it's it's very clear if you look at the, the the pandemic and so on. You know and yeah. So I think there is something, but I don't know what you think about this question. Um, I think that's really good. And I, I actually had a question for, which is similar to this, that I wanted to add into the mix for this part of the discussion, um, which was, um, so I see so many um, open science tools coming up 
No. And I'm finding that incredibly inspiring. And to me, I think it's the most important part of open source hardware is this movement within open science. Like, like it's most interesting to me and most important to me anyway, like creating these tools for open science. And I think that what you just said, Maximilian, um, the idea that some technology is in the public interest and therefore it should not, you know, it should be shared. I think that's a really, really interesting um, area of discussion. But I'm really curious to hear from you, Louise, like what, what your impressions are being somebody who's so, so, so much into the open science movement, like how much, you know, are you seeing a lot of the people come from hardware, they coming from software, are they scientists who are learning these skills? Like, like what kind of, what is the community comprised of in open science and open science hardware? I'd be, I'd be interested in that. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, um, I, I think I'm with you in, in this excitement uh, with the possibilities we have um, of, of bringing uh, open hardware and uh, free and open source um, practices of sharing and community making to the sciences. But when it comes to open science more broadly, I think it's kind of, um, it is, it's a very diverse community, right? Like you have um, folks who are only in publishing, debating questions of publishing and creating platforms from open, open open publishing you have you have folks who are really into building software for reproducible uh, scientific workflows and 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 us like doing the hardware side of things like we're a very new and small community but as you said like it's really exciting because we're very uh, we come from different parts of the world uh, we're really concerned with the state of science in terms of like IP hoarding and in terms of the inequalities that uh, characterize and have been characterizing the field of sciences forever right like we need to change science as it, it's being made and make it more accessible make it more inclusive so um, I see that open science is a very complicated rubric right now because um, you have even uh, uh, actors like corporate actors who, who had nothing to do with anything open whatsoever who are now uh, uh, trying to join and, and, and calling themselves open and involved in open access. And I'm talking about Elsevier, <laughs> right? So um, it, is, it is a complicated rubric. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do to um, bring uh, what we do in open hardware to open science. And I don't think we're quite there yet. I think there's more work to do. Um, But that would be my impression, you know, my personal impression um, of of the state of uh, of the field. And I somehow have the feeling that in Germany or in Europe, we we have the chance to really work on this public money, public tech topic, Mm -hmm. because there's also like new government now, there's right to repair happening really as a point in the agenda so so there is some some motion in the right direction i wonder um from this us centric perspective or something is there like like similar pathways that one can really like tie funding to open hardware and and have a similar idea or is this impossible well, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but uh, it's a hard sell. In the United States, uh, we're very, we have a long history of if anything cool is going to happen, we have to get together with other people and do it ourselves. We don't rely on the government to do it, that's for sure. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting that after World War II, the United States paid for um, uh, governments to come together. And of course, the motivation was uh, for economic control, uh, the wrong reasons. But as as a result, there's culture here that people expect that if something cool is going to happen, the government should pay for it. And they should. Like, why do we have these governments if they're not going to give us uh, some kind of return for the power that we give them? Um, but in the United States, there is an open, uh, there is a right to repair movement going on. And there's this one guy, uh, uh, Louis Rossman, who's been putting out all these incredible videos uh, through the, the last many years about how to repair things that seem impossible to repair, like uh, Apple laptops. Um, but he does that and he shows people how to do that. And he's been driving this right to repair thing. And he got Steve Wozniak, uh, the guy who, 
uh, created the first Apple computer, which was totally open uh, when it came out, the Apple II. Uh, but then Steve Jobs came along and says, "Not with my company." And then he squeezed all these people out, and people uh, lost their uh, shares of stock. Uh, similar story to some other people who are kind of dicks. But um, anyway, Steve Wozniak uh, got on board, and um, and he's kind of high profile, so it's getting some traction. So there's possibilities there. There's also possibilities that um, um, the government, people in government, are seeing that there's an advantage for more people to see uh, security issues. And there's been a lot of security issues you might have noticed that have bitten large corporations uh, in places where they don't want to be bitten because uh, it hurts their um, quarterly earnings, which is a bad thing. And then these politicians don't get reelected if they don't get the money from these corporations. Uh, as a result. So, anyways, there's possibilities. It's not impossible, uh, and we should be encouraging that. I would say that also something that's been really catching my eye over the last few years in terms of open hardware have been um, public institutions um, like CERN, who've been publicly funding a great deal of work. So, um, CERN um, is this particle accelerator laboratory thing in Switzerland, and, they, and they've and they got own hardware team now. Um, and they've, in fact, for a number of years, they were heavily invest, investing in KiCad as well, the, the open source design tool, which massively pushed it on. So I do see that there's, there is opportunity because of the centralized funding in Europe, there's opportunity to make quite big change. Like, so centrally funded, like science, I guess, right? There's a lot of like the EU funds, gives a lot of money to these institutions, Whereas, I guess in the US, recent immigrants don't really know, like there's a lot more defense funding, right? You know, it's, it's less, it's it, like the, the, there's a lot of money in the EU that's for these, these research things. And then there's people that are questioning that. So if we're paying for this with our taxes, then why is this not open? You know, so, and that's a very strong argument because, like, how can you argue with that? Like, if the, if the citizens are paying for this stuff to be developed, then how do they not have access to the papers? How do they not, how are they not allowed? to know how the methodology was done. How are they not allowed to see the, you know, that's a very strong argument for open science and open hardware is like, hello, we're paying for it. It should be publicly accessible, you know? So I, I, think, thought I think in Germany, but this is just uh, a theory, um, <laughs> Uh, that uh, open hardware or, or hardware which comes out of the science sector is kind of like an implicit or, um, or maybe explicit uh, 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 push for the economy, you know. So be because sometimes there are startups maybe starting out of uh, this. I think this is the idea which they have, but uh, I don't know. So maybe you get this argument if you say here, um, make, 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 make all of this uh, open hardware. Um, I think we only we only have a, a, a few minutes, and there are a, a lot of questions in our pad. Uh, I don't know; we can't answer answer all of these uh, in this uh, short time. I answered some of them, but there is one which is maybe very interesting, but it's not possible to uh, end up um, with. We, we could try. Do you see the interests of hackers looking for bugs in open hardware compared to the interests attracted by bug bounty programs offered by? corporations. Um, I don't know if somebody is able to answer this very shortly. <laughs> Well, if there are projects that um, people feel that it's it's part of, you know, they have their heart into it, of course they're going to be looking into it. Um, but if it's just um, being motivated by making money, there's a whole bunch of people who are motivated only by making money who are going for the the ones with big bounties. Um, but there was a talk at Exane. Uh, was that yesterday? Um, about responsible dis disclosure. And that's all stuff that's being driven just because people know it's the right thing to do. So, um, yeah, if things are open, there will be some at least percentage of people who will be doing it just because it's something they're driven to do from inside rather than uh, externally through uh, making more money. Yes, um, I, on this topic, um, I think there's um, opportunities for, um, you know, um, um, compensating folks for fixing problems. Um, 
but I think what's happening and has been happening, I'm, I'm working on a project right now. It's, it's a small project. Um, um, we're funding a small company, uh, an open hardware company called Electronic Cats uh, from Mexico. And I'm working with them and we're porting um, MicroPython to a microcontroller that is a low power microcontroller from the SAM um, series. And this is something that I think happens a lot in open hardware and we need to see more of that. We need to see investment in fixing uh, problems and porting, uh, you know, frameworks that we have to different chips. So we have alternatives when we have a shortage of a particular chip. Uh, and we can also reuse uh, chips that are not as popular, but they're widely available. We shouldn't, like, just dispose things. We should be reusing things as much as we can. So uh, other than fixing problems and bugs, I think there's also a need for investing heavily into addressing things that we need uh like uh, uh lee was uh, alan uh, was saying talking about um cern the investment that cern made on kicad that alan was talking about was massive and that transformed kicad as a project so now kicad is like a breeze and it's lovely to use and before cern came into the picture kicad was a nightmare Right, it was really hard to use. So now it's it's just the, the, the that's the importance of investing in in, in the tools uh, that we have that we need. Yeah, so we we've got to wrap up now. Uh, unfortunately, our, we're out of time. Um, but just uh, one brief comment before we go: uh, uh, and a government investing in open hardware, open software, all these open projects is an investment for the infrastructure for all of society. Very much like making roads has been, uh, and, and railroads, and all of these other factors that other people pick up on that can then add to the economy in so many huge unknown ways. And what we're doing, all of us here, uh, collectively, is adding our, our little parts of that. But if the government got involved, that could multiply um, and, and in, in a huge way. And um, with that, I think we're really out of time. So it's been great seeing all of you. I hope we can all be together at uh, a Congress all in one wonderful place again. And um, perhaps next year, perhaps one of the camps this summer, perhaps Hope in New York, who knows? So. Uh, Wait, there's an open source hardware summit. Maybe, who knows? It's, but that's in May, isn't it? I always forget the date. I always say it wrong, but it's either in April or May, Open Source Hardware Summit, New York. And there is also, I run a festival, or, I, you know, I theoretically do. It's never happened since I've had my new job, but there's a um, called Teardown in Portland, slash or in Portland, Oregon. So if anybody is local and interested in open hardware, do come along to that um, probably in September. So. Yeah, but yeah, open source hardware summer. Who's going? Is anyone going? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Yeah, I'm that's all. Hey, another excuse to me. Yeah, if it happens, I'm going. So, yeah. Just do it. Yeah. Yay. Super cool. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, we're doing a little talk tomorrow on uh, the prototype fund hardware at seven, same stage. Uh, yeah, and I would love to continue simply, but uh, I think we'll have to re redo this another time. And uh, thank you all. Thank you so thank much. You. Really nice to see some of you in person for, uh, you know, not just on the <laughs> Square. Yeah, and I'm desperately jealous of Mitch being in x <laughs> <laughs> It's really nice to see you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Thanks Bye, a lot, everyone, everyone uh, for, for having this discussion here with us on the x stage. Mm -hmm.